Okay. Uh, we're live, Missy? We are live. It's being recorded. And we currently have nine attendees, 10 attendees who are, have joined us. Um, and I'm sure a few more will trickle in. I can see the numbers building up. Okay. I'll let the numbers build up because I can see the, the clock ticking over. We're at 20. Um, to those of you who have joined us, welcome. Um, my name's Tom Ray. I'm the Managing Director at Accessible Homes Australia. Um, and with me online um, is my friend and colleague, Perry Cross, who hopefully you can all see. Um, he's, he's the CEO of um, Accessible Homes Australia. Um, we'll just allow some more people to get online before we get underway. <clears throat> okay. All right. So we look fairly static here at the moment. We have, I think, most people, most people on and, and ready. So, um, as I said, my name's Tom Ray. Um, this is being hosted by um, um, Accessible Homes Australia, which is essentially Perry Cross and myself. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. This is the first time we've done a live webinar like this. So bear with us, we're, we're feeling our way as we go, but we thought it might be nice um, in a COVID world, I suppose, where we can use technology and all come together and, and um, talk a little bit about SDA and, and, a, and a little bit about from some people who um, are quite experienced in SDA or, or have been through the process of registering or, or having their registration decisions reviewed. Um, just talking a little bit about uh, how the processes work and, and how STA works in general. So um, can I welcome my panel colleagues um, who are with me today? Um, Brendan Wolfe, um, uh, Brianna Barry from MS Queensland, um, Greg Barry uh, from SDA Consultants, no relation to Brianna, um, and his colleague Ben Pinley, um, Josh Lowe, who's an SDA participant, and of course to Perry Cross, um, who I've mentioned before. Um, welcome to all of you who are joining us. I think you're coming from all over Australia, which is wonderful. The SDA is a national um, scheme, so um, it's great to have you all here. Um, for people living in the community with very high support living needs, securing suitable housing has traditionally been a challenge. Um, prior to the NDIS and the introduction of the SDA, um, it was for many next to impossible. Um, specialist Disability Accommodation, or SDA, is, as the name implies, um, it's permanent home accommodation, which has been specifically modified for people who live with a disability. Um, specifically, the scheme is designed to have created and built normal residential homes in normal residential communities, which have special features designed into the home to provide help day to day for people who have high support living needs or people who live with extreme functional impairment. Um, Perry and I got involved in the SDA scheme a couple of years ago, I guess through Perry's own experience. We've been friends for a long, long time since we were at school um, and we've been involved working together through Perry's um, Medical Research Foundation, the Perry Cross Spinal Research Foundation for, for over 10 years. And I suppose for Perry, um, 26 or 27 years since his accident, um, while a lot of things have been um, going right for him in terms of um, you know, his general health and, and his engagement in the community. One thing that I suppose has always been a challenge for him, like we just mentioned before, is his permanent home accommodation. Um, he sort of moved from place to place um, through a variety of different accommodation settings, but um, a lot of those settings left him in suboptimal situations that, you know, were, were not homes that were designed to cater for his needs. Um, and in some cases, quite dangerous in terms of, you know, the, the accessibility features if there is an event of an emergency. So, so I guess Perry's story is a story that's um, similar to thousands of Australians all around the place. Um, about two or three years ago, Perry began talking to me about the SDA, and it was a scheme that he'd heard about that was part of the NDIS. Um, the NDIS hadn't rolled out in our part of the world back then, which is the Gold Coast. Um, but Perry was keen to investigate the SDA um, because it seemed to him like it be, could offer the first opportunity that he'd had for a permanent home solution in a supported um, environment that 
suited his needs. So um, long story short, we went out um, and, and um, through the help of Greg Barry, who's with us here today, Perry set about registering himself for, for SDA, um, a process which itself took quite a long time back then because he was dealing with frontline NDIA, NDIA staff who at the time, I don't think it's seen too many SDA applicants come through the Gold Coast office at least because it was all new. Um, but eventually, I think after 12, 12 months or so, um, got himself registered um, in the high physical support category for SDA. And then came to me and said, um, with my background in, in property development and home building, um, can you help me find a home, uh, an SDA home? And um, of course, on the Gold Coast back then, there were none because the, the or the, there were none for Perry's category of, of SDA because the scheme didn't exist. So we set about um, locating a, a, an apartment that suited Perry's needs. We modified that apartment to the SDA design standard and after another number of months, finally moved Perry into that apartment. And, and the success story for Perry um, changed his life. I think he might talk to you a bit later on about, about what SDA did for him, but um, it was life changing for him, but it was a very com complicated, I suppose, um, and uncertain process that he went through. And he sort of said, you know, we need to go and do more of these to, to help more people like me come up with the same solution. So hence Accessible Homes Australia was, was born and um, we now have another 19 SDA apartments under construction here on the Gold Coast. Um, and um, we are working through tenancy matching and, and finding suitable tenants for all those properties as they come online. And hopefully, if things goes, goes to plan for us, we'll be expanding further out into further parts of field in Australia and, and offering more places um, over, the next, over the next six months or 12 months or so. Um, like, like Perry, I said, as I mentioned, S NDIS participants may find it difficult to navigate their ideal SDA outcome. And with a lot of information and supporting documentation required as part of the evaluation process. So sometimes what we see is participants um, who make the application um, for a certain category of living. Um, for Perry, for example, it was the sole occupancy apartment that he was looking for, as opposed to perhaps a, a group home um, setting. Some people will find that after submitting all the information and, and receiving a, a considered response from the NDIA, it's not the response that they were they were expecting. Um, and you know, for example, a person like Perry might apply for sole occupancy SDA and three or four months later receive a, a shared home outcome back from the NDIA. Um, we just wanted to really have uh, get get everyone together for this webinar event to to arm participants with the information they they need and the advice they need to pursue an SDA outcome that's right for them. And if there's an initial response that comes back, um, in some circumstances there's there's review processes and appeal processes where um, the NDIA can have a look at more information and and, and more can be submitted back and potentially a different outcome can be achieved. Um, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it is. So, um, but the main message is SDA is a bit of a journey and sometimes it takes a bit of persistence and perseverance. So um, an initial response that is unexpected might not mean the end and doesn't mean that you should give up hope um, on the process. So um, we're gonna get underway now. I'm gonna hand you over to um, Brendan Wolfe. Um, there's a there's a chat box Q and A box there. Um, if there's any questions as you hear people talk, um, just type them into the chat box, and I will keep an eye on that, and I will do my best to answer any queries or direct um, answers to the relevant speaker. So Brendan, um, who I'm going to introduce now, has many has many years experience um, in administration and local council disability services, um, Queensland um, Choice Passion Life uh, CPL. Um, in the past 12 months, Brendan has undergone his SDA assessment where he was successfully approved for a high physical support apartment through um, the housing hub support. He's currently going through the process of appealing the initial decision about his SDA. However, he's recently moved into a, his own SDA apartment in Logan, I believe, Brendan. Um, and for Brendan, um, as he said in a Channel, 7, a Channel 10 News article that I heard, it was 36 years um, 
uh, that it took to move out of his home finally and live independently in his SDA apartment. So congratulations on achieving that, Brendan. I'm going to hand it over to you now and you're going to talk to us a little bit about the different types of SDA and finding what's right for you. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Brendan. I'm a lived experienced facilitator um, employed by the Housing Hub. And my, my role is to assist um, participants um, with helping them with their um, SDA journey. And I've got my um, colleague here, Lydia, Lydia, Lydia from the, she's a um, housing options facilitator and she's going to take you um, through some of the technical aspects um, that the housing hub um, that we help you with. Um, first of all, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and the connections with the water and land that they um, abide by. Um, once again, thank you all for coming here and I will now hand over to Lydia. Thanks so much, Brendan. Uh, I am just going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so I uh, am here to uh, just give a bit of a, a brief introduction, I guess, about what is SDA. Um, so specialist disability accommodation refers to housing for people who require specialist housing features. So these properties assist uh, with the delivery of support that caters to a person's extreme functional impairment or very high support needs. So funding is only provided to a small proportion of NDIS participants with an extreme functional impairment or very high support needs who meet that specific SDA eligibility criteria. We expect that there will be about 28,000 people or about 6% of overall participants um, who have SDA in their plan once SDA is fully rolled out. Uh, if you would like to know more about what SDA is, uh, we do run regular workshops at the Housing Hub and we also have an online uh, learning package which you're more than welcome to make your way through. Um, and I'm sure we can provide some links to that um, afterwards. So in terms of SDA homes, uh, properties can be uh, different, made up of all different building types. So there are houses, apartments, townhouses or group homes. Um, and these can range from one person living in there up to five people living in a group home. There are also different design categories, which many of you will also be uh, already be familiar with. Um, but there are five main, there are five categories. So people who are found to be eligible uh, for SDA will generally have a design category allocated when they receive their determination back from the panel. So that decision will be based on the recommendations uh, that were made in their application. The first design category is basic. So basic is for existing housing and it's only provided for participants who want to remain in their current group home. So basic is um, a category that will not be built in the, uh, in the future. The next category is improved livability. So this category is for people who don't really need any of those unique design features and most likely won't have a mobility impairment and don't need strengthened features to help keep them or others safe. So some of the, um, I guess, features of improved livability um, is that it's easy to move around in, the doorways and other features are easy to see, there's good visibility from one room to the next, it's easily adapted to suit individual needs, and improved livability will meet the Housing Australia's sil uh, silver standard. The next category is robust. So robust is for people who have complex behaviours and who might sometimes be a risk to themselves or to others. The features include adequate space and safeguards for the needs of residents with complex behaviours, 
to reduce the risk of residents hurting themselves or others. Um, secure windows and doors within all areas. Impact resistant walls, fitting and fixtures. Uh, appropriate soundproofing to minimize the amount of noise that passes from one area to the other. Laminated glass, um, areas of egress for re and retreat for staff and other residents to avoid harm if required. And robust will also meet the Livable Housing Australia's silver standard. Fully accessible is for people who have significant physical impairment, such as wheelchair users. So in a physical, a fully accessible property, you will see no steps at external doors and external outdoor private areas. The bathroom of, and um, vanity will have a hand basin accessible in a seated or standing position. The power um, supply to the doors and windows uh, for ret retrofit of automation as necessary. And there will be consideration given to making the kitchen sink, the cooktop and the preparation bench and key appliances accessible in a seated or standing position. Um, and fully accessible will need to meet the Livable Housing Australia's platinum standard. The last design category is high physical support. So high physical support is for people with significant physical impairment and who need a high level of personal support. So features in high physical support include no steps or um, at the external doors and external private uh, outdoor areas. The bathroom vanity and hand basin will be accessible in a seated or a standing position. The power to, there'll be a power supply to doors and windows and um, retrofit of animation automation as necessary. Um, consideration will be given to making the kitchen sink, uh, cooktop, the meal preparation bench and key appliances accessible in seated or standing position. There's a structural provision for ceiling hoists and the property will be assistive technology ready. There'll be heating and cooling and um, household communication technology. Emergency power solutions to cater to a minimum of a two hour outage where the welfare of residents is at risk. And 950 millimeter uh, minimum clear opening with doors to all habitable rooms. So for a high physical support uh, will meet the Livable Housing Australia's platinum standard. I'll hand back over to Brendan, uh, who's going to talk us through uh, finding the right home for you. Thanks, Lydia. Um, so, um, so now we're going to talk about how do we find the um, our accessible homes. And with the use of the housing hub, we can actually, I'll get Lydia to, um, if you could put up the slide for, for this part, I'll, um, I'll go through it with you. So we encourage participants to, when they first log on to our website, to create their, um, their, their home seeker profile. In this profile, uh, in this section, you can go through the, li the list of what you might be requiring in your SDA home. We also ask participants to register for our online workshops. These, um, these are held regularly on a, a, about, a, about one or two a month that we um, they run across the country. We've been doing some face to face face ones are in Queensland, but um, most of them are online. And we encourage participants, support workers, anybody, uh, support workers, support coordinators, allied health professionals to um, to register and they can, um, and we can assist them in where we think they met uh, in their housing journey. It might be as simple as with their application or how to start the, the SDA process. We, that's pretty much uh, um, what, how that works. Lydia? 
Thanks, Brendan. That was great. All right. It's, that, that's it from Lydia and Brendan. Hey, Lydia, I should just apologise. I didn't introduce you at the beginning. I'm sorry. So, oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> So Lydia is with um, with the housinghub.org.au. Um, the Housing Hub's a fantastic resource. It, it, to Perry and me, it's kind of like the realestate.com um, of accessible housing. So is that a fair enough assessment? Um, so yeah. If, if you're looking for, for a, um, a home in a certain area um, with certain types of accessible characteristics, to fit any one of those design categories that Brendan and Lydia just outlined for us. Um, you can put those into a search filter on Housing Hub and, and it should bring up a list of um, housing options to suit you. So um, for those of you who are online who haven't been to the housinghub.org, but are you have a look at it. Um, it's more than what I just said. It's got all these other resources attached to it um, that, you know, from, from after this webinar you can go along and find out lots more information about the SDA through that website. So thank you both. Um, now the next speaker I want to introduce is um, my friend and colleague at MS Queensland, Brianna Barry. Um, Brianna um, and MS Queensland are our um, Perry and my tenancy intake um, partners for our AHA projects. Um, you don't have to be living with MS um, to have MS Queensland help you out. So um, MS Queensland look after all sorts of different people with different types of um, supported living needs um, and Brianna will generally be the first point of contact for people who are um, at least coming through Accessible Homes Australia looking for an SDA solution. Um, you can go onto our website and um, fill in a little contact information form that tells us a little bit about you and then that information will then be passed directly to Brianna who will then have a look and see whether or not any of the apartments in AHA's category uh, catalog can help you out, or perhaps if there's any other properties that MS Queensland are uh, looking after that, that might be suitable. So I will hand you over to Brianna, who's going to talk to us a little bit about when an application for SDA goes into the NDIA, what are the sorts of information which are important um, to uh, help ensure that you receive the right outcome um, as a response. Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you, Lydia and Brendan, as well, for that really comprehensive um, guide on what SDA actually is. Um, as Tom mentioned, I'm from MS Queensland, so um, we're an organisation that was established with a vision to see uh, a world free of MS um, and its impacts. Um, so we provide a range of free and funded service to people with MS. We've expanded into people uh, supporting people with other neurological conditions as well. And in particular, our accommodation branch, um, we typically support people with high physical support needs, um, which of course is the category of SDA that Tom and Perry Accessible Homes Australia specialise in. So um, yes, we're working with them to assist people with their housing journey. So going from looking at accommodation options and expressing interest in one, all the way through to receiving your SDA outcome, potentially appealing. Um, and we tap into a lot of the resources of the people who are here to represent uh, different organisations like Housing Hub, like Greg Barry and SDA Services. Um, so it's great to be a part of this panel. Thank you for having me. Um, I might start just a little step back from what the um, actual NDIS is looking for with your application. And, and I'll start with what is really important to do as your first steps uh, towards uh, working out your SDA funding. So um, as Lydia and Brendan mentioned, obviously looking around at the different options in the community and starting to get an idea about where it is you might like to live, what kind of design category you think is right for you, um, whether you want to live with roommates or whether you think single occupancy is more suited to your needs and your goals. Um, and then it's about communicating that back to the people that either support you with your NDIS, that could be a support coordinator, informal supports, or directly with your local area coordinator or planner about wanting to explore this as an option. What highlighting that does um, is it usually leads to a plan review if you don't already have a goal around exploring your housing options in your plan to assist with giving you some funding for the supports that are needed to navigate this housing pathway. The first thing I'll say is that it can take a while. So um, you definitely don't want to start looking at your SDA options if your need to move is tomorrow, for example, because there is a whole process that goes towards ensuring that the SDA supports are given to the, the right people that qualify for the right type of living category. And then, of course, connecting you into a different housing option, the moving process, all of that can take a while. 
Um, I will look around at my colleagues in the panel and say we're finding on average it's about six to ten months from when you first may express interest in a property um, if you're right at the beginning of that SDA journey before you likely ending up as a tenant within a property like, um, like Tom and Perry's at Palm Beach and Hope Island. Um, so starting with that is just ensuring that you have a goal in your plan related to exploring your housing options um, to assist with some of these other parts that I'll talk about now. Um, there are two really, really important key documents that are going to assist with getting your SDA outcome and putting forward, I guess, um, the best information that you can to help the NDIA understand not only what your care needs are, but what your preferences in terms of your living situation are too. Um, the first one is a relatively new form that's actually been developed by the NDIA called the Home and Living Supports Request Form. This form is a bit of a catch-all with any sort of living situation or changes in a living situation that you might uh, be experiencing. So it is not exclusively for specialist disability accommodation, but specialist disability accommodation is certainly one of the solutions to a housing problem that you may be experiencing that's captured within this form. So look, I'll be very upfront with everyone here. It's 19 pages long. You're gonna get it and it's gonna hit you and it's gonna feel a little bit overwhelming at times. However, there's 14 pages that you need to fill out Many of them are check boxes rather than requiring you to put extensive amounts of information in. And it's a really good place with a, a lot of good um, opportunities for you to really discuss with the NDIA exactly what it is that you're looking for in terms of housing for yourself. The second key document um, that's really, really important for you um, in getting the right outcome the first time, or at least giving all the information um, needed to get the best outcome you can is a it's a document that comes with a range of different titles. Essentially, it's an OT functional assessment that applies your functional uh, requirements, your functional needs to SDA legislation. You might find that some places call it a housing report, other places call it an SDA assessment, um, but essentially what it is is an OT working with you to match your functional requirements to a design category that Lydia covered really, really well in her PowerPoint before. Um, that uh, OT report is also a key place for you to discuss um, where you'd like to live because that's part of SDA outcomes as well. Um, and I'm talking location there. So Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast or, you know, where MS Queensland, but even interstate, you know, go, go wild, really figure out where it is that you'd like to see yourself. Um, it also covers the design category, which is really, really what you're looking for from your OT is that functional application of your needs to a design category. Um, but then you've also got the opportunity to talk about whether you are looking for single occupant living or perhaps a shared outcome because you are looking for roommates and that level of social interaction really helps you tease out exactly what you're looking for in these kinds of reports. Now, my advice would be submit that home and living uh, request form as soon as you possibly can so that it gets to the home and living branch and is with them for them to assist you with what other next steps they might require in order to support your um, exploring housing options journey that you're on. Um, it is a it is a form that goes to a particular department that's relatively new with the NDIA that assists people with their living options. Um, and in addition to that, you can indicate that a housing report is on its way to provide them with more information about where it is you'd like to live and how it is that you'd like to live. Um, so they're the essential parts to get into the NDIS. Um, you have many different resources and organisations that can help support this journey if you're looking for advice or guidance. You've got people like Lydia and Brendan at the Housing Hub. Um, they're, I guess I'd call them your umbrella corporation at Summer Foundation has some fabulous resources for you to use as well. Um, MS Queensland, we have uh, on our Facebook, YouTube and website some videos and other resources that you can access to to learn a little bit more about what these different steps within that housing journey could look like for you. Um, and if you are looking at a site that MS Queensland either supports our partners to do intake for like Tom and Perry or something that we might be building ourselves, um, please get in touch because we are happy to support you through that journey as well. Thank you, Brianna. That's fantastic. Um, so as, again, I, I would encourage anybody if, you, if you're interested in at least in the projects that we're working on at Palm Beach or Hope Island, um, get online to um, www.accessiblehomes.com.au, fill in the contact form and send your information through and Brianna will give you a call or, uh, or one of her colleagues and, and help guide you through the process. So it can look scary, but with Brianna's help, um, it's not so scary. So um, thank you again, Brianna. Thanks for being here today. So, so next, um, I'm going to introduce you to um, 
Greg Barry, um, no relation, as I mentioned before, to Brianna. Um, Greg is based in Brisbane, um, has a company called SDA Services. Um, Greg's been closely involved in the, NDIA, in the SDA space since its inception. Um, like Perry and I, he became involved with the NDIS through his own personal experience, helping someone close to him with the scheme and um, has now built an entire um, consultancy services organisation around helping people um, navigate the SDA journey. So um, as Brianna just said, if you prepare your information correctly and you, you, you get the right amount of help to um, get it lodged, hopefully you get the right outcome. Sometimes, however, you don't get the outcome you're expecting. And that's where sometimes someone like Greg can perhaps sit down with you and have a look at the response and have a look at your initial submission and, and help you go back and have a work with the agency to have a, have a second look at it. So I'll hand you over to Greg now and he can talk a little bit about more of these process, processes. Greg. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for this privilege, uh, Tom and Perry. Um, I've uh, had my uh, colleague Ben here with me. Uh, Ben's kindly come back from his uh, law studies study leave to join us today to give us his insights. Um, and yes, our topic is, you know, what if um, the option to review a decision is, is being considered after a decision has occurred? Um, a part of a fair bit of what I'm going to talk about, I guess, uh, apologies in advance, is a bit dry uh, in a sense from a legal perspective. Um, but these matters are, uh, are guided, prescribed by uh, pieces of legislation and particularly the NDIS Act and uh, the SDA rules. Um, very briefly about ourselves, we've been um, doing this work for since early 2018 and it's been a really privileged journey. Um, uh, Perry was possibly the first person to talk, use the words life-changing in my experience, um, but certainly not the last, Perry. You know, um, it's it's a very, very, very common statement, and it's always uh, uh, sits very nicely in our uh, on our ears and in our hearts to to, to hear that expression. Um, so, in terms of um, reviews, um, you're probably mostly familiar with the expression "review of a reviewable decision," and that. Um, provision, um, that expression comes from section 100 of the NDIS Act. So I'll, I'll mention the various sections just in case it's of interest for participants in this discussion to take some notes. Um, the, so review of a reviewable decision, of course, um, necessarily implies that a decision needs to be a reviewable one, uh, sort of sounds obvious, but um, it might be a surprise that some decisions by the NDIA under the NDIS aren't reviewable decisions. Um, uh, good news is that in my view, in our view, all SDA decisions are reviewable decisions. And with section 99 of the NDIS Act, um, and in particular item four, which prescribes why Ben and I would say that an SDA decision is a reviewable decision. So um, that's the first step, I guess, is, is, to, is to assert that the decision which has been received is a reviewable one and, and that's the basis upon which that can be properly asserted in our view. Um, the, it's important also to know that participants are entitled to, and the CEO, of the NDIA of the NDIS um, has um, an obligation to provide SDA decisions in writing, and um, the the provision that I'm referencing here is Section 100, subsection one of the NDIS Act, that says that the decision maker must give written notice of the re reviewable decision to each person directly affected. So obviously. Uh, uh, front and centre of being affected is the participant who's seeking the outcome. So if, it, if there hasn't been a, a written notification of a decision, um, or if there's any doubt as to whether the written no notification, for example, if it's, it's been a, an email from a planner, um, if there's any doubt as to whether that is 
that written notification, um, I'd urge participants to and their supporters to consider writing uh, to the NDIA and seeking confirmation um, that what has been received, if it's been received, um, is a, a communication of that decision um, by or on behalf of the decision maker. Decision maker in uh, for SDA is the CEO of the scheme and the CEO has the ability to delegate and he does um, his ability to, to make these decisions. So the ultimate um, sort of starting point, I guess, um, in, in going from a decision to a review is to identify that written uh, outcome and uh, be confident that it's a delegate um, that who, has, who has made that decision. So that's the sort of the starting point. Um, in terms of how to seek a, a review, um, the NDIS Act uh, provides that um, the, the request can be made orally um, or it can be made in writing. Um, the conservative in me says to put matters beyond doubt, you know, uh, ideally put these requests in writing. Um, and um, there's a provision in terms of, there's a, there's a time limitation under section 100 um, as to uh, a time period within which um, this reviewable, reviewable decision can be sought. And that's 90 days, uh, oh, sorry, three months uh, under section 100 subsection two. So that time frame needs to be uh, kept in mind in, in the calendar. Um, the, so, so they're the, the, the steps for, for seeking that. Um, I guess it's important to point out, and I'll ask Ben to take over the discussion shortly. Um, um, oftentimes the outcomes of decisions tend to put a spotlight on what might be controversial or, uh, or, or needing to be um, improved upon in terms of uh, uh, evidence and submissions to the NDIA. Um, so um, the comfort there is that in seeking a, a review under section 100, uh, new material can be um, provided, um, which uh, addresses matters that mightn't have been considered or considered closely enough when the application was first made. So we often couch those parts of decisions uh, of, of applications for review by saying, uh, we might have assisted you better at first instance um, around this issue. And um, now that we're focusing on this issue, um, here's some fresh, fresh ideas, some fresh evidence, maybe some fresh reports from allied health practitioners that uh, more closely evidence the matters that really need to be honed in on um, to address ultimately um, what's focused upon here, which is the uh, preferences and needs of participants uh, for the optimal SDA outcome. Um, I guess uh, before I hand over to Ben, um, a broad observation, um, a comment, I guess, is that um, uh, all participants have the benefit uh, and protection of some Commonwealth legislation uh, called the Legal Services Directions 2017. Um, what that's all about is um, uh, there are obligations by all Commonwealth decision makers, including um, representatives of the NDIA, to act as what are called model litigants. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful um, benefit um, that uh, is, is enjoyed by participants in this space. Um, the Commonwealth's obligation is to act honestly in, and fairly in handling claims and litigation brought by or against the Commonwealth or Commonwealth agency by endeavouring to avoid, prevent and limit the scope of legal proceedings wherever possible. So that's the, that's the obligation that the NDIA has and discharges in this space. Um, and, and that's an important one. So. The processes um, um, needn't be like the, you know, the hard, sometimes commercial world where, where litigation can be fought quite um, uh, strenuously and with consideration of, you know, other people's resources or, or lack thereof. Um, so that's a provision which is, is worth remembering that all participants in the scheme 
have the benefit of those model litigant um, uh, obligations that the Commonwealth has. Um, so very pleased to introduce you to my clever colleague, Ben, who's um, working uh, very uh, uh, well and, and full time in this review space. And uh, Ben will go on to talk about the, the further steps in the process uh, once the Section 100 application is lodged or perhaps even around the elements of, of, of putting together one of those applications. Cheers, thank you, Greg. First, just like to say um, how, how happy I am to be here to um, talk to you all today. And um, yeah, it's a massive privilege. And I suppose a na natural progression of the discussion once establishing that what you have in front of you is a reviewable decision is, um, how, how would you go about reviewing that decision? What does the review look like? And as Greg touched on, um, it's well within uh, participants' rights to merely um, relodge what was provided at the application. However, what we find is um, very beneficial is actually to attack it with a bit of a two-pronged approach. So as well as also uh, putting a spotlight on what perhaps was missed at first instance, also bringing in that additional information. And to provide a bit of an example, what we see many participants um, looking for for um, come to review a decision about would be around um, the issue of residing alone um, as uh, distinct as residing with another participant. And whereas at first instance, and we think very validly a, a focus may be placed on the participant's preference, there are also a number of provisions within the NDIS Act, uh, within the SDA rules, I'm sorry, which um, do um, set out a number of explicit considerations which the CEO may have to have. So in this review, uh, um, what we tend to do is um, collect additional evidence which uh, perhaps goes to how, uh, continuing with this example of how may a um, living independently improve um, the participant's economic participation? For example, are you, uh, may the participant be more likely to um, be able to engage in work or study if they're in an environment where they're living on their own. Social participation, would, would a, a participant um, perhaps um, be more likely to have their friends over or um, be more likely to go out and engage in the community if they have that space to, um, to, to um, come home to, which their own. I think that um, perhaps once I, identifying the issue of um, okay, well, I've established my eligibility in this example. So um, how can I really then focus on the issue which has been raised in my eligibility, uh, in um, the decision? Really, um, really dialing in on um, those issues and bringing more um, additional information, which may be um, information being provided by, by parents, by family, by friends, or as Greg alluded to, allied health, um, allied health um, reports, which um, may may touch upon the the, the mental health impact of um, reside, uh, residing with another participant as, um, as distinct from residing alone. So I think that really um, focusing in the efforts from um, a more general um, a more general approach. To really, really um, crystallizing the issues and really, um, really focusing in on the issues which um, present themselves through that initial decision, and through that, it, it is um, the best outcome that the Section One Hundred is um, is successful, and um, the the participant is able to um, go out into the market and look for um, the home. Of, of their dreams. But where that's not the case, and there is also the option of going to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or the AAT. And I think it's very important for participants to know that where, where you've looked for a reviewable, reviewable decision, where perhaps you're not happy um, of the outcome of that re uh, review, that there is a very strict timeline um, of 28 days in which um, you then have the ability to go to the AAT. And um, this is a space which we've been increasingly involved in in the last 
um, few months. And um, it's one which um, participants are, um, have, it, it, it's definitely a area where a participant um, shouldn't be daunted by the proposition of going to the AAT and um, where positive outcomes um, can result. And I think I may just pass to my uh, colleague, Greg, just to talk a bit, a bit more about that AAT. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, the AAT process um, uh, is uh, described as de novo. What that means is that um, it assumes that everything is being considered afresh. So it's not so much a, a process of reviewing um, uh, prior decisions and, and attaching any sort of qualitative um, uh, judgments about them so much as it is about looking at all of the material that's presented to the AAT on the day of the hearing. Um, so it's, it's, it's refreshing, I guess, in that ex extent, you know, um, minds and thoughts can be exercised, you know, afresh ar around all of the issues and, and fresh evidence is, is readily uh, welcomed in the AAT. Um, it's a process that has a couple of um, milestones, which are case conferences, and they're really uh, good opportunities um, for uh, discussions to be had to try and resolve the matters. And the pro process and the tribunal is very supportive of parties coming together and discussing and seeking to resolve matters. And it really is the case that uh, these matters are are frequently resolved in that spirit of cooperation between um, participants and, and the NDIA. So it's, um, I think um, Ben chose his words well, that it oughtn't to be considered uh, daunting because it is a well-supported process um, and, and outcomes. Uh, it, it's a rare thing that the participants leave the AAT um, unhappily in our experience. Um, so I, I guess they're the, they're the main comments, uh, Tom and Perry and, and, and uh, everyone listening that we, we wanted to share today and certainly welcome any questions. And, um, and once again, we're really grateful for the, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you both, um, Greg. And don't, don't go on mute just now because I was just going to ask you a couple of questions. I can see there's some questions accumulating in the chat. What I might do is I'll get to you. Uh, Josh, in a second, let Josh um, say a few words, and then I'll come back to the chat, and everybody can open up their mic and answer. Um, so, Greg, can I just ask, what, what's the most common reason for a review that you see? Um, what comes up most frequently? I think definitely, you know, Ben focused on the participants' preferences. Uh, to not live in shared with other participants settings. That's that's very common. I, I think at eligibility, much less so, but it, it does, does occur from time to time. Um, I think um, so far as apartments are concerned, uh, two bedrooms or, or, or one um, is, a, is a quite a common area of, of potential controversy. And in this design categories, um, there's a uh, the tensions, I guess, or, or, or the areas of focus can be between fully accessible and high physical support, improved livability, and robust. Um, I think that's my best summary of, of, of the main issues that we come across, Tom. Okay, so it's a range of issues, and um, and and how frequently does do, do people receive an outcome that you know that that wasn't entirely to their expectation and they come to you and say can we have another look at this is it something that happens a lot infrequently all the time um i'm conscious of your first comments you know in the introduction that we you know um it's you know this is a wonderful scheme and, and the ndia are doing a great job and we don't always just we don't always agree um and um in terms of frequency it's it's an honest statement to make that um, it's been a far more common situation since um, the, the latter half of last year until now um, and um, that's for example why Ben's plus one other colleague is working full-time in this in this role um, uh, how frequently 
I, I couldn't, I'd, I'd be really be giving you a crude estimate, but possibly sort of 15 to 20% of outcomes are considered, um, you know, around the review issue. And, and look, in some ways it's not surprising because I guess the whole, the NDIS is designed to be bespoke solutions to people's individual needs. And that therefore sometimes, you know, requires quite a deal of insight into individual circumstances and, and, and there and comes with that information and interpretation. So I guess what I'm getting at is um, people shouldn't be too surprised sometimes if things get interpreted slightly differently from one end to the next and you have to go back and have another conversation. So I, I know from experience talking to, you know, participants who have contacted us, you know, sometimes quite devastated they didn't receive the outcome they got. Um, I realise it can be quite confronting, but at the same time, sometimes it's not all that unexpected that, you know, you're dealing with complex situations and, and you know, human beings trying to interpret, you know, very personal um, situations um, from the participant application side that sometimes might need a little bit more um, discussion and, and interpretation. So, again, the reason for doing this today is to just encourage people you know, STA is a great outcome for, for people, as Perry, you know, will attest, and I'm sure Brendan and, and Josh. Um, but it's it's not an easy one sometimes to get to. So um, it's a matter of perseverance. So thank you guys very much for coming along and chatting to us. Um, I'm going to introduce you now to Josh. Um, Josh is an NDIS participant. Um, he's just going to tell you a little bit about his own experience um, through receiving an outcome and then um, that outcome perhaps being something that he wasn't expecting or wasn't quite right for his personal circumstances. Um, and so he went back and requested a review and went through a bit of a process and ultimately ended up with the, with the outcome that he was seeking in the beginning. But um, I'll let Josh sort of talk a little bit more about that. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, everybody. So as Tom just mentioned, uh, I have finally gone through the whole process from start to finish. And as Brianna mentioned at the beginning, it is quite lengthy. So just uh, over 12 months from start to finish for myself um, with my original uh, registration application for SDA, um, I received my first outcome just before Christmas which was almost what I asked for, but not quite. Um, and so decided, went back to my original team, had a discussion, um, decided that, yeah, I should have a, I should review um, the outcome. So I went through the S100 uh, review process and that came back uh, reaffirming the original SDA decision. Um, and at that point, it had been a lengthy process. Uh, it had been quite frustrating, quite exhausting, a little bit disheartening. Um, Did you feel like sort of giving up at that point, Josh, and just basically taking what you'd been given? or were you Yeah, pretty much. At that point, that's where I was at. Um, but as it was pointed out by a few people, you only get one shot at this. So you might as well swing for the fences and make it a good one. And the other thing that I asked myself is, can I live with this decision? So what happens if I find out later down the track that another participant similar to myself um, did finally go to the AAT and, review, and have an independent review of their review? of their original outcome uh, and they did get a favorable outcome. Would I be kicking myself? The answer to that was yeah. So um, it's, you might as well just go through and ch keep chipping away. You gotta be persistent uh, and you need to just keep persevering. Um, don't let the discouragement get in the way. Um, and if you think that you have justified your position and you've proven that what you're asking for is reasonable and necessary because at the end of the at the end of the day that's what the SDA and the NDIA is looking for um, you know they want to see that 
they're getting value for money that it's reasonable and necessary. Um, and I thought that I had, and I thought that we had done that. So um, yeah, finally got the outcome that I'd asked for originally. Um, and that was, came just after 12 months. So um, I guess for me, the important things are to come out of all of this is to surround yourself with good people that know the space really well. I was fortunate enough to have uh, three individuals that, that helped me out. Greg was one. Um, Simone Burley was another from Imaginability. She'd been working with Summer Foundation. Uh, and the third person was Julie Yule from Greenlight. She did my occupational therapy um, report. So um, between the three of them, they all did exceptionally well and helped me through the process. They also encouraged me all the way through just to keep chipping away and not to, not to lose heart. So it's um, important also, I found to not be passive through the process. So it took about six or seven months for me to receive that first uh, decision. Um, and during that process, uh, about four months in, I hadn't heard anything from anybody. Um, so I started making some or trying to make some attempts to get some information to find out where my application was at. Um, I went to my LAC. Um, they tried to get some information for me. I tried my support coordinator uh, to get some information, but they sort of ran into a few brick walls. I asked Simone and Greg also to ask on my behalf, um, but it always came back to, yep, the panel has it. It's in front of the panel. They're considering your application. It's not too much time. It seemed to be the sort of uh, standard response that I was getting. Um, I even tried phoning the NDIA directly, um, but they couldn't give me too much more information either. So eventually I, um, I made a formal, I guess it's complaint through the feedback um, system that the N NDIA have, but I didn't receive any response to that. And um, I had uh, my support coordinator at the time uh, register again a complaint on my behalf. And then I received the decision within about a week of that being lodged. So you've got to make some noise and you have to be persistent. Okay. Josh, thank you very much for that. Um, I appreciate it and congratulations on getting the result that you finally sorted out for yourself. So fantastic. Um, um, I'm going to hand you over to Perry now to sort of wrap it up and then, and then I'll go through the chat box um, and ask everyone to open their mics up and we'll answer questions as best as we can as we, we go through. Some of the questions that have come through, I think may have already been answered just through a general presentation and discussion, but we'll see how we go. But anyway, Pez, over to you, mate. Thanks, Tom, and thanks to all of our um, listeners today and uh, all of our speakers today. It's been a great chat. Um, I guess um, from my perspective, I was keen to share the, the fact that um, SDA, when you achieve it, and when you've moved in, I've been now living in SDA for approximately 18 months, and it's it definitely is life-changing, as Greg mentioned earlier. Um, it, it's an incredible... Um, change to just living in the community, um, being, um, not feeling vulnerable in the community. Um, just to give you an idea, I live in a high physical support apartment. Um, it's very close to cafes and um, public transport, um, shops, you know, grocery stores, all those sort of things that make life much simpler and not difficult um, because everyone knows, you know, when you live with a high physical um, injury or disability, then um, life's challenging enough as it is without having to sort of jump over more hurdles. So the, I'm adamant and I'm probably the scheme's biggest believer that the SDA is one of the greatest innovations in Australia's you know, modern times. Um, 
and I'm, I don't think I'm overstating it because the NDIS alone is a great innovation. You know, it brings together a national program that allows people flexibility, choice and control to be able to move around the country. Um, when you tie in accommodation to that, it's a wonderful scheme. And when you um, also tie together that, it allows people the, the choice of, instead of having to share their housing, which is the traditional group home model, um, we're now saying to people, well, you can have independent housing, um, but maybe you want to consider sharing some of your supports. And that's what makes the scheme sustainable. That's what makes SDA sustainable. Um, and I think once we get over a few of these initial hurdles that we've experienced early on, um, the road ahead will be much smoother and much clearer for people. Um, but I'm, I'm a strong believer that this work had to be done properly. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be a part of the SDA reference group. So that means that I get the opportunity to, to um, you know, speak to the agency about some of the decisions being made and why they're being made and give feedback. So we will get to a point where um, people's decisions are being um, you know, more quickly assessed and more quickly um, you know, delivered so that people can move into appropriate housing. Um, I must say one of the other things about my housing supports is that I'm also on a ventilator, which is basically life support. I have a, a backup battery, you know, and in these, this era where, um, you know, it's not easy to get a hospital bed to be able to stay in my home and be cared for by my support team instead of having been admitted to a hospital in case of a you know, long-term power outage. And that's reassurance for me that um, the scheme is designed and working. So. It's those little things that make a, a big difference. Um, I guess that's probably all I need to really say. We've got a fair few questions and in the sake of time, we might um, bring it to a close and take some questions. And uh, if anyone wants to have a, um, you know, a more detailed chat about it, then we're happy to take questions. Right. Um, and Pez, I reckon, you know, if there's anyone online with us today um, who wants to talk more outside of this session, just get in touch with us. Our, Harry and my contact details are on our website. Just drop us a note and um, we'd be more than happy to organise a call or, or a chat separately of this for any, any specifics. But um, in saying that, I'm going to just go through the list of questions that I can see here in front of me and I might direct some of the responses to some of my colleagues here as I read them out. So. Um, just in the chat box here, I can see um, Jessica has asked the question, I'm vision impaired. Um, could you repeat the section you said before section 100? Maybe maybe that's uh, Brianna or Greg can just talk to that, Greg? Greg's statement that she was referring to there, so I'll, I'll let Greg answer that one. Yeah, thanks, Brianna. So the, the review of a reviewable decision uh, section is section 100 of the NDIS Act. Um, presuming anything about that question, um, the, the relevance of vision impairment um, uh, might uh, warrant a look at the STA rules, um, um, particularly around extreme functional impairment. Um, so in that section... It's section 12. Section 12 of the STA rules, I also recommend a quick look at. Okay, all right. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, Angela's just asked the question: Is there any data on how often an STA applicant has the has to actually um, fight the decision with the NDIA? I, I hope I sort of covered that, and Greg responded during their presentation. I, there's no real data on that at the moment. Um, it's more of a case by case situation. So I hope by listening to Greg earlier, you you got some sort of a feeling for that, but. Um, I guess the, 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 the response would be, if you do get a, a, a response that, you know, wasn't in line with what you were anticipating, um, you know, just let someone like Greg or, or Brianna or your, your support coordinator know about it. Um, and now hopefully, you know a little bit more about the steps that you can go through. Um, you can initiate a process like that. Um, okay. The next one, um, Jessica, again, do you have to have SIL support attached to SDA? I reckon that's a Brianna um, question. 
Yeah, well, I can answer that. So MS Queensland provides both SDA and SIL. We provide um, SDA at some properties, SIL at some properties. Um, in The answer is in terms of NDIS framework, no, they aren't two linked concepts. Um, there is no tying SDA to SIL within any part of the NDIS framework. Um, you'll find that most specialist disability accommodation um, uh, particularly when they're clusters of independent um, apartments or, or even share homes with people that have particularly complex needs that there will be a SIL presence there. Um, but the delivery of those kinds of services is really up to the individual rather than a particular provider saying, well, you must access this SIL provision in order to live at this SDA property. Um, so look, it's very rare to find someone, um, shall I say, who doesn't qualify for SIL if they live in an SDA environment. SIL being, sorry, to the audience, SIL being supported independent living, which is generally 24 hour um, uh, presence of support staff in order to assist people living at a particular dwelling. So, so they're not technically tied, but you'll find most SDA does have some component of SIL. Um, it's about the participant who moves into that SDA property. You still have choice and control over who actually delivers your supports. So complicated question, uh, complicated answer, sorry, to that question, because it can be a bit complex. You'll find that organisations sometimes link SIL and SDA, but NDIS-wise, they aren't linked, and you're welcome to request a different provider if that's what you want. Thanks, Bree. And, and you'll see in the AHA Accessible Homes Australia contact form, we actually ask the question, do you have SIL um, in your NDIS plan? That doesn't mean to say that we can't help you out if you don't have it, but it's it's helpful for us to know up front in, um, in, in starting a discussion with you. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to pass the next one. Um, this is from Angela. I'm going to ask Lydia maybe if she can help us with this one. Um, and I'm curious to hear what she says. Are you able to advise how the process will change, um, and I should say, if at all, with the introduction of independent assessments? Um, do, uh, do OT still write report, or is the role of the IA to do all of the work? So there's another tricky one for you. And yeah, this one I actually don't know the answer to, so I'm not sure uh, if anyone else has got ideas around that, but um, I'm really happy to go and find out, but I don't know that we necessarily know that information yet. Look, I, that's probably what I would have said. Brianna, have you got any other response to that? As far as we've been um, told in terms of engagement from the NDIA, there hasn't been an indication that SDA will have independent assessment attached to it as a process. Um, that does not to say that it won't at all, but right now they haven't been linked. So I suppose it's a bit of a watch this space kind of area and keep on top of those um, news announcements that come out from the NDIS because it's a question we're all asking ourselves right now too. Okay. All right, that's great. All right, I'm just going to turn to the uh, to the question, direct questions that I've received here. Um, the SIL has come up again. We've answered that one. Um, if a person is found eligible for two participant apartment with OOA, approximately fifty thousand dollars, but the family bills what was actually asked to be a single participant with OOA duplex, what rate would the NDIS fund them at? Uh, that's a <laughs> Brianna. <laughs> Me again. <laughs> so, um, so what you get from the NDIS is your maximum budget. So the maximum that the NDIS will contribute towards paying an SDA provider for where you choose to live. So if you have been funded and look, I, I don't have that question in front of me. I hope I've remembered it correctly. You're saying you've got a two person, two bedroom apartment, say with OOA attached, and that person wants to live in single occupant living. The advice that you'll get from the NDIA is go and talk to the developer, go and talk to the SDA provider about um, bridging that gap. And what the NDIA's advice to the provider is, is we'll look at alternative ways to fund the difference between those two amounts. That can be quite difficult. Speaking as an organisation that's a provider and, and, and certainly looking for Accessible Homes Australia as well, it, there's a reason why those price points exist. And part of that is the amount of finance that goes into building a particular property. It sounds like you're talking about a high physical supports property too. So, so we're well across um, how much goes into building a property like that because of all the different features and design features that um, Lydia has outlined in, in her presentation. So look, that's your maximum budget. And I suppose that's when you might look and say, well, if that's the maximum that the NDIA will fund me, but my goal is to live in a property that's single occupant living, then perhaps it's the review pathway that you want to look down to try and make sure that those amounts match um, or at least closer to, and then you can look at alternatives if there is still remaining a gap. Um, it's a complicated conversation. 
On the other hand, from a dwelling perspective, so providers like Accessible Homes Australia, the max that they can charge someone is whatever the dwelling registration is. So for the Palm Beach apartments, for example, that's a two bedroom, one person, high physical support apartments. You pop that into the good old SDA calculator you can grab from the NDIA. That's the maximum budget that they could take. Um, look, I'm, I'm happy to talk in more detail in a different forum about what that means with different dwellings, villas and, and different things that you can do fully accessible properties. If you're at high physical supports, what that crossover looks like. Um, but in general, what you want is your maximum budget to match or be higher than the type of dwelling that you actually want to live in. Yeah, great answer, Brianna. And, and that is something that we're seeing quite a bit of, of late. Um, people who had applied for um, a sole occupancy um, uh, independent living apartment receive a, a shared outcome like that. Um, it's a real difficult one for people like us, providers like us, because as Brianna said, um, sometimes the funding that comes with a shared outcome, um, try as we, as we can, or as much as we'd like to help people out, the funding doesn't um, allow us to cover the cost of the uh, SDA apartment. Therefore, um, we just simply can't accept people um, at, at certain levels of funding. So um, yeah, that good answer. Um, bit of an issue at the moment, but we're, we're, we're seeing a little bit less of that of late than maybe what we saw a few months ago. Um, okay. Uh, Melinda asked, just out of curiosity, what was the missing from Josh's first decision that he wasn't happy with? <laughs> You're on mute, Josh. Uh, yeah, sure. I um, I have some substantial overnight uh, requirements. So um, I asked for the NDIA to fund a second bedroom um, and they originally said that wasn't reasonable or necessary. So uh, we went back, re-strategized, thought that we'd met uh, the threshold for reasonable and necessary, um, reviewed that came back as no we're upholding that original decision so then i thought well try one more try go to the aat um and they independently reviewed it and came back with a favorable decision said that yeah the information provided did justify what i'd originally asked for so um so now that allows me to live independently uh without having to share and without putting any excess burden on overnight assistance. Okay, thank you. Um, question for Greg and Ben. Um, how do you review a decision that's out of time for a, a review? Okay, um, my recommendation would be um, to seek under section 48 of the NDIS Act, a, a rec make a request for an unscheduled plan review and raise uh, the issue um, in that forum um, if the outcome of that process is unsatisfactory in the participant's view, then that can be a trigger. That decision itself can be re a reviewable decision under Section 100. So it's a effective, the Section 48 um, uh, plan review process is in effect, can be an effective restart of the process. I may also just add to that as well. If you've had a new plan uh, put in place since um, you received that, um, your SDA outcome, and it's within a 90 day period of receiving that new plan, you're then able to go through a review of a reviewable decision route yeah. um, through that. So that may be also something which you'd look, um, may look at um, coming down. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, one final question. Um, and I'm gonna put this to Lydia or to Brianna. Um, this is from Karen. Um, is there any updates coming to the price guide to cover participants who live with families? For example, a four bedroom house needed for a family where the parent is the SDA recipient. That is currently there is no house, one participant rate or formal rules on how we can pay for the extra rooms. I'll, I'll throw to you first if you like. Yep. Yeah, so I was just going to say absolutely right around um, there. So um, what some we do find uh, some people um, get tripped up with is uh, the number of residents that uh, people get back in their determination is the number of um, SDA residents living in that home. So 
um, a two resident determination means to people who have SDA in their plans. Um, and we often find that people interpret that two resident determination, meaning that they will be able to have uh, that that second person could be a family member. Um, so if you are looking to live with family, which um, is now possible, you do need to um, have that one resident determination in your plan. Uh, and as you said, Karen, there's currently no one resident house. Um, we do see some people using the townhouse villa duplex building type as a workaround to be able to get um, that one resident determination, but then have family um, living in that home and, and the place still be big enough to realistically be able to have a family in there. Um, but in terms of when we might see uh, a multi-bedroom, a, a, a multi like a, a single resident house, I guess, in the price guide. Um, I might just throw to anyone else to see if they've got an idea about when that might be reviewed, but. Like, I don't know if we've got much insight into exactly when that will be reviewed, but a, a recent update. So the first update that I can think of that was related to this was in July, 2020 from memory where um, in the past, if you did want to live with family members, you were automatically changed to be a shared outcome, which essentially, in the case of that example before, a single occupant versus a two-bedroom, two-person um, funding is roughly half the amount of um, funding. Um, so essentially, your, your SDA contribution to a provider got cut if you wanted to live with other um, family members. That was updated, and part of that update included a section G that was attached to the SDA price guides, where you might find that um, say you move into um, Accessible Homes Australia's apartment, um, a two bedroom, one person, um, high physical supports apartment, um, you notice a reduction in the amount that your maximum um, notional budget was by about three to five grand. And the idea is that the um, that's to allow another person to live in that home with you and, and the difference should be made out in the rent that they would contribute um, to that SDA dwelling. So all a bit complicated there, I know. Um, right now, any house determination for anyone that's not aware of this in the audience uh, results in shared outcome automatically. A house is considered like a, a group house, not house in the terms that you might be thinking in the community, which is usually what you think of if you want to live with a family and have a bit of a yard. And, and, and that's kind of the idea that's in the mind. It, it's just different when it comes to SDA determination of a house. Um, and Lydia mentioned Villa Townhouse as another alternative to that, but it's probably also worth noting that a uh, house is the um, has the lowest funding attached to it. A townhouse villa is the next one up. It is actually an apartment that has the most the highest dollar value in terms of funding attached to it. So, um, what the general idea is now is if you get a one bedroom or two person apartment, that maximizes the funding that you can contribute towards having enough room um, to host your family members. Right now, that's the maximum that an apartment can be um, registered to as a two bedroom, one person. But that doesn't mean that more rooms can't be provided. That's just the maximum amount that they're able to register to in order to receive the corresponding SDA payment. So look, hoping there's an update like that. There seems to be work going on to try and bridge that gap that currently exists in the SDA market, which we saw in that, that legislative update that happened prior. Um, but right now, I wouldn't be able to tell you when it's going to happen. I'd say that you'd look to maximise your funding from an SDA perspective so you can try and find the right fit for you and your family. Okay, thank you. And I said that was the last question. We've got one more that's just come in from Alicia and, it's, and we'll just try and answer it quickly because we're, we're running out of time. Um, if you have SDA in your plan but find home mods are better, can this be done on a new house purchase? I, I have to say I don't know the answer to that. Um, um, you'll need to get home modifications in your plan in order to do that, but that's a conversation that you have with the NDIA and with an OT, you can provide a quote on what sort of housing mods um, you might be looking at uh, putting into the new home to meet your needs better than an SDA response. Um, yeah, so and talk to the NDIA. Yeah, that's that's part of SDA, right? Yeah. Yeah. It can't be covered by SDA. It's a separate budget. Um, you just need a chat to have that budget put in the plan. Okay. All right. Well, um, look, that's it from us. I just wanted to say thank you so much to my fellow panelists for uh, giving up their time to come online and, and talk to us all. It's been great seeing you all. Um, and thank you very much to all the participants um, in the forum who have come online. And um, I've been watching the numbers um, stay relatively static right throughout the whole session. So it's been a relatively long session. Um, I hope you've all got something out of it. Um, and you know, perhaps if there's something that um, we haven't covered that you would like us to consider for a future webinar um, topic.
um, just drop us a note and we'll consider it and maybe do another one of these at another time and answer some more of your questions. Um, I'm going to give Perry the last word um, and I'll sign off and say thank you very much and I hope to see you all again soon. Over you, Pez. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. And once again, thanks to all the listeners and the panellists. It's been a great chat. Um, I guess I'd, to leave you with a, a message, if you're in the um, in the SDA space, then please persevere. Don't um, don't get up too early. It's a it's a process and it's a journey, but it's a very worthwhile journey. So um, thanks again. Cheers, Thank everyone. You. All right. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everyone. See you later. Thank you. See you.